Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with WETA, is thrilled to be here with Iconic America host and executive producer David M. Rubenstein, author of The American Experiment. As many of you know, Rubenstein's book, The American Experiment, is part of the Iconic America Summer Reading Challenge. It has been the designated book for June. So I hope you've been reading it. It's going to be a great conversation today. Iconic America, Our Symbols and Our Stories with David Rubenstein premiered earlier this spring. It explores American history through a close examination of iconic national symbols, indelible artifacts, places, and archetypes. Hosted by co-founder of the Carlyle Group and patriotic philanthropist David Rubenstein engages in conversations with historic thinkers, community members, and subject matter experts. Together, they dive deeply into each symbol's history and how, it mean, how its meaning has changed over time, using the symbols as a gateway to understanding America's past, and present. The series focuses on eight American icons, including Fenway Park, the Hollywood sign, the Gagston flag, the American cowboy, Statue of Liberty, the American bald eagle, Stone Mountain, and last but certainly not least, the Golden Gate Bridge. Let's take a moment to watch the trailer. There are hundreds of historical monuments across America. It represents determination, commitment to the future. These markers are one way a nation tells its story. For us, the eagle is more than just a symbol. It's a relative. But how we perceive them changes over time. What it's supposed to symbolize is the abolition of slavery. I would love for the whole story to be told about Stone Mountain. Well, Iconic America series resumes on PBS stations across the country on Tuesday, July 11th at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Check your local listing. As we consider this series, we are also challenged to think about the symbols that endure and speak to what society values and how people see themselves within their own communities. Libraries and museums across the country are a great place to do that. Today, we will focus on The American Experiment, which was published in 2021 and highlights the ever-evolving American experiment by focusing on democracy, culture, innovation, and ideas. It features Ken Burns, Madeleine Albright, Wynton Marsalis, Billie Jean King, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and many more. Then we'll be turning our attention to the new series, Iconic America, our symbols and our stories. Now let's meet our esteemed guest. David Rubenstein is the host and executive producer of Iconic America and the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, a global investment firm. Mr. Rubenstein is the chairman of the boards of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Council on Foreign Relations, the National Gallery of Art, and the Economic Club of Washington, as well as the University of Chicago and Duke University. Mr. Rubenstein has made transformative gifts for the restoration and repair of the Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, Monticello, Montpelier, Arlington House, Mount Vernon, Iwo Jima Memorial, the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the National Zoo, the Library of Congress, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mr. Rubenstein is the original signer of the Giving Pledge, the host of the David Rubenstein Show and Bloomberg Wealth with David Rubenstein, and the author of The American Story, How to Lead, The American Experiment, and How to Invest. It is my extraordinary honor to welcome in David Rubenstein. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I would love in your own words, if you could describe, we've been talking about what this book is and we've read it and we've listened to it on audiobook, but could you put in your own words, what is this book to you, The American Experiment? Well, America, when it was created uh, in 1776, 
with the Declaration of Independence in effect creating the country, obviously we had to win the Revolutionary War to actually have the country go forward. But it was an experiment that was uh, very unique in, in Western world, an experiment in creating a representative democracy. Historically, governments in, in uh, Western Europe were uh, governments where there were royal families that were really running the, the country. Uh, we decided here, our founding fathers did, to have a representative democracy under which people would get to vote for their leaders in different kinds of forms. And we would try to do something that would live up to the dreams uh, articulated in the Declaration of Independence. The most famous sentence in the English language was written in the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, when Jefferson wrote that in 1776, he probably didn't realize he was writing what became the most famous sentence in the English language and really the creed of our country. The creed being all men and really all people are created equal. The book, The American Experiment, is designed to show how from that time we tried to say everybody is equal, we've lived, tried to live up to that, and obviously we've had false starts along the way. When that sentence was written, what Thomas Jefferson really meant was all white Christian property owning men are equal. He didn't mean blacks. He didn't mean women. He didn't mean people were Jewish or Muslim. But obviously we've been trying over the last 250 years to live up to the ideal that is in the page of the Declaration of Independence, but really wasn't in the mind of the founders because they really didn't believe that all men were created equal. Uh, they also didn't believe all people were created equal. But we have taken those words and tried to live up to what the words say. And it's been a, a complicated experiment over the last 250 years. Quite complicated. And we'll be celebrating the America 250 very soon as well as we lead up to 2026, which is exciting. And there's more PBS books programming that goes along with that. And I know the work you're doing aligns very much with that sentiment as well as we explore our country's heritage and history. How long did this take to put together? And, and really what sparked that idea? Because it followed the American story and had a lead. How did you get to doing the American experiment? Well, I thought that the Declaration of Independence is a very famous document. Maybe some people would say uh, the, the uh, kind of birth certificate of our country, as it's been called by some. But it's sad that we actually haven't lived up to all those um, ideals that are articulated in that document. And we've been trying over the last 250 years to say that women should be included, um, blacks should be included, uh, all minorities should be included, uh, all people of all religions should be included, people of all uh, genders and sexual preferences should be included. But clearly there have been struggles along the way. So in the book, I talk to people who have are experts on some of the struggles that have been involved. So an expert on what we did to uh, Native Americans and how they have not really been living the full American dream or people who've talked to people of, of different sexual preferences uh, and how they have struggled to live up to get to the American dream and kind of uh, participate in the uh, words of Thomas Jefferson. So it's been a struggle. Uh, clearly, we are not a perfect society. We are better than any other society of any, any size like ours, but clearly it's an ongoing uh, challenge to live up to those words in the Declaration of Independence. It is, but but I think even the work you're doing, which is raising awareness of these these essential documents and also these it's the brain trust of America. You've interviewed them, you've put them in one book for us to be able to explore and read, um, which is is really a gift. I mean, I will say a lot of the the names on the cover, I was like, oh, I got to interview that person, or I've you know I've I've watched something or read something by that person, but it's all in one book, which I really thank you. <laughs> it's, well, it's thank extraordinary. You. Um, so I want uh, two other points I'd like to convey. One is that um, Thomas Jefferson, in effect, said, uh, and many times he wrote about this, that a representative democracy depends on an informed citizenry. If we don't have an informed citizenry, we're not really likely to have a real representative democracy. So sadly, we don't really teach civics very much anymore in junior high school or high school. And you can graduate from virtually any college in this country without having to take an American history course. So many Americans just don't know much about our history. And George Santayana, a famous Harvard philosopher and professor, once said, 
that those people that don't remember history are condemned to relive it. And the theory of civilization is that as we progress, we move forward, we learn from the past, the mistakes, and we benefit from the things we did well in the past. But if you don't know what you did wrong in the past, you're not likely to uh, avoid those mistakes. So I'm trying very hard to, with other people as well to educate Americans more about their past. A second point I wanted to convey is about the documents and the buildings. Uh, what's the point of preserving the Declaration of Independence, the rare copies of it, or the uh, Emancipation Proclamation? We know what's in the text of those documents, so why do we actually need to have the originals? Well, it turns out that the human brain is not yet so developed that it can look at something on a computer slide and treat it exactly the same way as if you see the original. So, for example, if you're going to go to the National Archives or any other place that I might have put an original document of the Declaration of Independence, you're likely to prepare for it by reading a little bit about it. When you get there, you're likely to have a curator explain it to you. And when you leave, you're more likely, the test show, to read about it afterwards. So you're more likely by seeing original documents uh, to, to learn more about the history of those documents and the history of our country. The same is true with uh, buildings. So the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, if they are run down and shabby, people won't go there. If they are built better and rehabbed, uh, then people will go there and get more out of it and hopefully learn more about our country's history. So that's what I've been trying to do. Well, thank you, <laughs> because I think the investment in the restoration of those places make them someplace that people want to want to go and visit and explore and learn about. And it sparks, especially in young people, it sparks that love and interest for learning more. And you know, it's so cliche, but young people are the future of America. And so to be able to have them and their their parents get excited about the those important historic places, as well as the 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 documents. Right. And I, I always say there's a lot about primary source material and documents that that's so critical within yes. your book. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I would add, for example, take the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial is probably the most visited site in Washington, D.C. We don't really have completely accurate numbers because you don't have to actually go through a door to get into it. But probably at least 20 million people a year go to visit the Lincoln Memorial. It's a wonderful building, but it doesn't educate you that much about Lincoln. So as part of the rehabilitation with the National Park Service, we are building an underground education center. So when people go to the, the Lincoln Memorial, they can go under the Lincoln Memorial and be in a classroom where you can learn more about Lincoln. And that's a way we're going to try to get more and more people to be familiar with Lincoln, also more about our history. That's really exciting. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, so within the American experiment, you outlined 13 key genes that have been most essential to produce and sustain America. What do you think three of the most important genes are? Well, what I was referring to, obviously, is using a, a metaphor, is mm -hmm. that, uh, that we have certain things in our body uh, politic, in effect, that are part of our genes. So they are different than the genes that somebody might have in France or in China. Our genes are things like the belief that uh, the right to vote is very important, uh, the belief that equality is very important. These are genes that are part of our system. Now, we haven't lived up to all of these things all the time, but Americans do believe that, uh, for example, uh, the right to vote is worth fighting for and dying for, and many Americans have died for the right to vote. Uh, sadly, we don't use it as much as we should. So in a presidential election, we are thrilled if we get 62 or 63 percent of eligible voters to vote. But what about the other 30 some percent? Why don't they vote? So hopefully we can get more and more Americans to vote because therefore we would get a more representative democracy. We'd actually have all the people voting who should be voting. But the belief in the right to vote is an important gene. It's an important gene as well that we believe that everybody is equal. Now, we know that everybody isn't technically equal, but everybody should have equal rights and equal opportunities. And that's what the American uh, uh, gene is in, in that respect. Uh, we also have a, a gene that believes in uh, that elections are supposed to be fair and elections are supposed to be uh, open to all of those eligible to vote. And we believe in the and we believe as part of our genes that the elections are very important. Thank you. Your book is divided into six parts, right? Promise and principles, suffering and sorrow, restoration and repair, invention, ingenuity, creation and culture and becoming and belonging. So as you think about those different sections, how did you 
did you think about aligning some of those metaphorical genes with the different sections? Um, are there certain genes that stand out in those sections? And, you know, all of those I do think support our American system, but how did you decide on, on those titles and how did you decide on those, you know, those buckets? Well, um, I wish I could tell you that it was very scientific, but in the end, uh, to get people to be interested in a book, if you have 25 chapters and you don't kind of segregate them a bit or segment them, it probably gets a little bit overwhelming. So I, I did come up with uh, sections with my publisher that makes some sense. But for example, uh, one of the genes in America that's very important is entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. We do believe in this country that you can work hard, build a company, and uh, ultimately make a success of yourself. The American gene of believing in the American dream is very, very important. Sadly, in recent years, many people born in this country to lower socioeconomic groups do not feel the American dream is quite available to them. But interestingly, uh, people living overseas now believe that the American dream is very possible for them. And so we have 50 million, 50 million immigrants in this country. Obviously, not all of them are legal, but people come here because they believe in the American dream. They believe they, they can rise up by hard work. And so an important gene is the American dream, the belief that Americans can rise up, come from modest circumstances and make something of themselves and make a difference in the world. And that's a gene that I think is really part, a very important part of our body politic. So within your, within your book, um, there are 27 of the country's foremost experts. How did you decide who to involve and were there, was there anyone that you wished you could have included that you weren't able to include? Well, I always want to interview some people that just aren't available or don't like to do interviews, of course. So I won't name them. But I would say that uh, what I try to do is have different categories of, of individuals, people that have overcome uh, challenges. For example, uh, I interviewed uh, Billie Jean King. Uh, Billie Jean King um, is a great tennis player but she is probably gonna be best known throughout history for having overcome discrimination against her sexual preference. And she was a leader in that uh, at a time when it wasn't that uh, easily available to do that, readily available. So those people who watch um, PBS books show regularly know that I love Back Matter. So I really enjoyed uh, looking at your citizenship test and looking through the questions. You really under, you underscore that the U.S. was largely built and populated by immigrants and their descendants. But I was really surprised that it wasn't until 1990 that new legislation was enacted. Yes. Can you discuss what happened? Well, when their country first started, anybody could show up and you didn't have passports or visas. There were no immigration officials. You just showed up and you were here. Um, gradually, uh, it began to be a little bit more difficult because what happened was initially people from Western Europe and basically Anglo-Saxons were coming to the United States and they were uh, considered by the people already here to be homogenous and, and part of uh, the same kind of uh, background. When people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe started showing up, or people who weren't Protestant, uh, there was some concern about it. When people from uh, Eastern Europe who were Jewish started to show up, there was concern. When people from Asia started to show up to help build their Continental Railroad, among other things, there was concern. And so, although we basically let people in this country pretty easily before 1925, in 1925, we passed very restrictive legislation, which was on the books from 1925 to 1965, and essentially made it much more difficult to get into this country. Under Lyndon Johnson, we did change that and made it easier to come in. But for example, during World War II, people who were Jewish who were trying to escape the Holocaust could not get into this country very readily because there were quotas on people from Eastern Europe. And therefore, their ships were turned away. And sometimes a very famous ship, the, the, the St. Louis, was turned away and people went back to Germany and went back and ultimately about a third of those people on that that ship were killed in the Holocaust. So we've changed the way we let people in this country. But if you do come into this country today, uh, legally or illegally, um, uh, you ultimately can become a citizen. And you have to stay here five years. Hopefully, it'll come in legally. But if you stay here five years and you then take a citizenship test uh, and you pass it, you can uh, become a citizen. Uh, we had the same test 
that um, that that immigrants are given. Uh, and 91 percent of the people who take the immigrant test, citizenship test, passed. 91 percent pass. The same test was given not long ago to native born Americans in this country. And essentially, uh, in 49 out of 50 states, a majority of native born Americans failed that basic citizenship test. Questions are things like how many branches are there in the first in the federal government? Who's the first president of the United States? So that basically just demonstrates that Americans don't know as much about our history as we, we should want them to have or know. And also that people coming into this country ultimately know more than people born in this country, which seems to be uh, not the way it should be. And solving this, obviously, if it's in 49 or 50 states, is, is a big undertaking. Is that why you you have the series Iconic America? Is that why, you know, part of that solution? I mean, it's multi-pronged. It's an education system. It's it's some people say that it maybe it deals with that it's social studies and not American history anymore in schools. What do you think is part of the solution? Well, there's no easy solution, of course. It's a big problem. Uh, and we have a lot of people in, in our country who don't even complete school, large high school dropout uh, rate. But what we want to do is in, in uh, elementary school, junior high school, when you can get students to focus a little bit and their minds are a little bit more malleable and maybe open to uh, new ideas, get them to learn more about our country's history and the principles upon, upon which it's built. Interestingly, um, I think people very often in China know much more about American history than people in our country, because in China, they do study at the schools American history. We don't study Chinese history all that much in the United States. We don't study American history all that much either. And part of this is due to the fact that about, I would say, uh, 25 years ago or so, there was a big concern in the United States about competition with China in technology. And so the phrase or the acronym STEM was invented. And STEM means science, technology, engineering, and math. And it was thought that you need to have STEM education in order to be competitive with people from overseas. And as a result, many uh, people in college began to just major in STEM subjects and not major in history or other kinds of things that might be considered social sciences. And I like to remind people that many of the people running our biggest organizations in our country, businesses or, or, or uh, foundations or universities are not STEM majors. Actually, people who have majored in social sciences do quite well in society, but there's been a, a concern that if you don't have a STEM major, you won't really uh, do well in society or later in life. For example, today in the United States, roughly all, if you take all the majors in history, uh, majors in college, roughly two to 3% are history majors. It used to be as high as seven or 8%, but history majors are gone down because it's not thought that that's what employers want. So uh, we've got a lot to do to kind of educate people about the importance of learning more about our history and about our country. And hopefully we can have more informed citizens. What do you hope that readers will take away from your book? Well, they should hopefully take away that they need to learn more than just in this book. So what you really want to do is look at this book as an appetizer, whet your appetite and try to learn uh, more about history. If, if any of the chapters in the book excite you, go read more about the people who are in the book or about the same subjects. So no one book is going to solve all of our problems, of course. But I do think a book could be an appetizer or whet people's appetite. And that's what I'm hoping to do. Uh, nobody, of course, can can solve all these problems by him or herself or herself. To answer your other question on iconic America, that is, for those who don't know, that is a uh, PBS series that is uh, four of the shows have aired and another four are going to be airing in, ju in July. And what we try to do is to take symbols of our country and then make an interesting story about how the, the symbol became important to our country and what, why the symbol is still important to our country. And the, ear, the reason it might work is that people understand symbols. For example, take the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was not really built to, uh, to welcome immigrants. It was really built to thank the United States for ending slavery. And it was a thank you by the French who had already ended slavery. But it, it evolved into a symbol of welcoming of immigration. And that's OK. But what we want to do is let people know how the Statue of Liberty came about. And if you watch the series, you'll learn more about the history. And hopefully that, too, can be an appetizer to whet your appetite to learn more about America and America about the Statue of Liberty. And so we've taken symbols because symbols encapsulate in a very brief uh, form uh, a larger subject. So take the Golden Gate Bridge, a symbol. It's a symbol, really, of a, uh, an, an engineering marvel. It's one of the most 
iconic bridges in the world. Many people cross it. Many people don't know the history of it. So the theory was, why don't we talk about America's engineering uh, prowess and do that through the symbol of the Golden Gate Bridge? Well, for those people out there just joining us, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You are watching PBS Books. It's my pleasure to be here with executive producer and host from Iconic America, David Rubenstein. And we are here discussing his book, The American Experiment. Back to the conversation. So you just shared about Iconic America and that's such a great transition into really what I wanna focus on for the remainder of the conversation. This spring, four episodes already aired um, and they focused on icons we mentioned earlier. Your season launched with a focus on baseball. You focus on the, which is, you know, the American, the favorite American pastime. You look at Fenway Park. Why did you choose Fenway Park and what makes it so unique? Well, um, American pastime historically was said to be baseball. Clearly, as uh, basketball and football become very popular, you can question whether American uh, love of, of baseball is as important to them as it was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But there's no doubt enormous numbers of people still love baseball and go to baseball games. And if you add up all the people to go to all the Major League Baseball games, it's actually more people than go to the football games because there are obviously more baseball games. So enormous number of people still go to baseball games, watch it on television. Uh, Fenway Park is the oldest uh, Major League Baseball stadium, built in 1912. And although many times people have thought, let's tear it down, let's make build a new modern stadium, uh, it has never happened because it's seen to be an iconic symbol of baseball and and basically and what baseball was at its roots. So it's been rehabbed many times. The current owners who've owned the, the team for about 20 years, when they bought it about 20 years ago, they decided to keep the stadium and rehabilitate it. And so uh, it's a symbol of our love of baseball. And interestingly, uh, the Red Sox, when you go to watch a Red Sox, game, Red Sox game or you want to go to a Red Sox game, they often have advertisements that say, come to Fenway Park. They don't say come to see the Red Sox. They say come to Fenway Park because it's so synonymous with Red Sox, but it's the park itself, which is actually a draw to many people. That picture right now is uh, a picture of me and one of the architects who helped rehab the uh, Fenway Park. And it's uh, in the um, it's what's known as the. Uh, the green monster up at the top of the green monster, the big wall that makes it uh, harder to hit home runs off left field. They, a couple of years ago, as part of the rehabilitation, they actually put seats, seats in the, uh, over the big, uh, the, uh, the uh, green wall, the green monster. And therefore you can actually sit there and watch a game. And actually, as I was doing that and filming this, a ball came nearby. Fortunately, it wasn't so close to me. So I, I wouldn't have to expose my inability to catch the ball. <laughs> um, Okay, so next one of the icons you explore is the Hollywood sign. What was surprising to you about the Hollywood sign? Well, many people have seen the Hollywood sign. And uh, what I did not know is that it was actually had nothing to do with what we call Hollywood, which is making of motion pictures. There was a, a, an effort in the early part of the, let's say, the 20th century, probably in the 1920s, really, to build homes in Hollywood, in the Hollywood area of Los Angeles. and the uh, homes were built by various competing companies. One of the companies was called Hollywood Land, and it was the, the Hollywood Land Company. And to promote their homes and get people to come visit them, they built a big sign called Hollywood Land. And so you could see it from all over the Los Angeles area. It was designed to draw people to look at the homes. Clearly, when the homes were all sold uh, in the Hollywood Hills, they took the name, uh, the land part off and just kept the Hollywood up there. And it was now symbolizes the motion picture industry. Now, the truth is there are no motion pictures really made in Hollywood. They're made in Burbank or other parts of the Los Angeles area. But if you go to actually Hollywood, downtown Hollywood, you'll see Grauman's Chinese Theater. You'll see the place where you can put your, your, your people put their hands or their feet in cement and there forever. Um, but it, it's interesting that people are drawn still to the Hollywood sign as a symbol of American motion picture uh, industry. The motion picture industry is well known throughout the world. We are the leaders in making motion pictures throughout the world and have been for about 100 years or so. Uh, the Hollywood sign symbolizes that, but uh, it's the history that I didn't know what was actually put up there by a land development company. Certainly an intriguing episode. I didn't know that either. And that was certainly my biggest surprise as well. 
My favorite episode that I've seen so far is the Gagston flag. Um, I really learned so much and I was hoping we could all watch a clip. For more than 100 years, there have been protests on the Ellipse. Generally, they've ended peacefully. People go back to their homes. But in the case of January the 6th, we had a very violent outcome. People marched from the Ellipse up to the Capitol, and they said, don't tread on me. And they used a symbol of that, which was the Gadsden flag. I know the Capitol well. I spent years working here, so understanding January 6th is personal. But what is the Gadsden flag? And who was the man behind it, Christopher Gadsden? So the Gadsden flag, we have a yellow flag with a... Coiled snake with its tongue sticking out. At the bottom, you can read... Don't tread on me, you know, or I'll bite you. Is the Gadsden flag a good flag? Well, that's kind of complicated. It can serve multiple political purposes for different groups because it does speak to this idea of a universal. Limited government, no tyranny, uh, you know, this idea of don't tread on me. This is the earliest print that we have here at the Library of Congress from 1779. And as you can see, a rattlesnake is entwined and ready to bite the European powers. The rattlesnake or the serpent was about the most feared animal, I guess, at the time. That's why it was a symbol of... Well, Europe didn't have ex exotic venomous snakes like America, and so it was feared. Where are we now in the Library of Congress? Right now we're in the James Madison Memorial Building. So you have humidity control and other things here? Yes, it's a climate controlled vault. And this is where all of our gold level collection items are stored. We'll be having a look at this item. Okay, this is the Pennsylvania Gazette from 1754. Join or die. So this is uh, the original Benjamin Franklin drawing yes. of a serpent cut in pieces. Yes, so this was the first political cartoon published in America. And what you'll see is all of these colonies are represented in eight pieces. Rattlesnakes were these sort of defensive creatures by nature. There was a certain appeal to that, this idea that we are going to take the high ground, uh, this defensive position. But if you mess with us, then, then we will come out fighting. Uh, and so that has this sort of colonial uh, frontier, uh, sort of rough around the edges characteristic that many of these colonists saw themselves as possessing. So why did you initially choose the Gadsden flag to be part of the series? Well, the Gadsden flag was a flag developed by those people who were against what the British were doing, imposing taxes on the United States or the colonies. And Christopher Gadsden was a prominent uh, South Carolina uh, revolutionary leader, also a businessman, also a slave owner. Um, and he basically developed this flag uh, using the serpent as a symbol and in effect saying, don't tread on me or I will bite you or the snake will bite you. Um, the irony is that while that was symbol that was used to fight against the British and against tyranny is now being used by some people in this country to fight against the federal government. And those people that protested on January the 6th or similar kinds of protests have used that flag, ironically, as a flag against our own government when initially it was Americans that were using against another government. So it's a symbol that in a really way, in many ways, has changed its its usefulness in some ways and its meaning, but it's an important symbol for the country. Well, thank you. 
your next episode that was that aired on PBS focused on the cowboy and it explores American mythology around the cowboy. What are some of those myths? Well, the American cowboy uh, is something that I didn't know as much about. I grew up in the East Coast, and as a boy in the 1950s, I was watching Hopalong Cassidy and 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 Gunsmoke and and shows like that, and I thought that the cowboy was really somebody that was basically spending most of his time uh, killing Indians. Um, as it turns out, cowboys really weren't doing that. Cowboys were basically herding cattle to trains so the trains could take the cattle uh, ultimately to slaughter and to meat houses. So, um, I realized, and I didn't know as much about the American cowboy as I should. And as I dug into it, I realized there are still American cowboys today, not so much herding cattle, but they are at rodeos. And so today, if you want to see what a cowboy does, you go to a rodeo and very often you'll see incredible skills of riding, uh, horses or riding, uh, cattle, or are doing various roping tricks or racing tricks. And so I did go to a lot of uh, rodeos and it's a completely different culture. If you live on the East Coast, you just haven't been exposed to that culture. So I would say that uh, the American cowboy is designed to say that this is what the cowboy originally was, was supposed to do. But it also, we try to point out that the American cowboy was not as portrayed on TV all white. Uh, about 25% of the cowboys were African-American, probably 25% were Latino, often Mexican. And so it wasn't quite what you, you see on TV. And it's a very difficult life. They often could be on these cattle trains for six months at a time. No shower, no fresh food very often. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult life, but it's uh, one that was part of our culture. And now we kind of keep that culture going forward through the, the rodeos in effect. Throughout the various episodes, including the cowboy episode, you explore inequality and injustice throughout American history through a diversity of voices. It really struck me that whether it was the Red Sox being the last team to integrate or an indigenous cowboy saying that he had to work harder to attain the same things at the rodeo, why, what was your biggest takeaway from that exploration and what do you want viewers to take away from that? Well, as I said at the very outset, the, the creed of the country was that all men and really all people are created equal and should be treated equally. That was the theory, obviously wasn't in practice. So when you go through American history, you'll see that inequality is a, a dominant uh, occurrence in our country. And so you'll see all people were not treated equal. And as a result, I think uh, it's a learning lesson for people that we should recognize that America hasn't really lived up to uh, its creed but we've been making progress in living up, living up to the creed. Uh, and so that's really what we're trying to do throughout iconic America. But mostly iconic America is designed to say, come watch this, learn a little bit more about American history, hopefully get excited about it and read more about it. What can we expect to see in your next four episodes that start on July 11th? Well, we have four episodes that uh, were filmed last year. Uh, these episodes are ones that um, uh, are quite eye-opening in many ways. For example, uh, the national bird uh, is often thought to be the bald eagle, but it is not technically the national bird. We don't actually have a national bird. It's on our currency. It's on our national seal. But the Congress of the United States has not actually picked a national bird. Uh, there are some people who say that uh, Benjamin Franklin really wanted it to be the turkey, but that probably wasn't true either. Uh, in any event, we have the, this incredible bird, which about 500,000 of which live in North America. They're, they are native to North America. Because of DDT after World War II, the population of um, American bald eagles went down to about 500 from 500,000. Now that we've eliminated DDT, the American bald eagle is back, and they are an incredibly uh, beautiful animal. They are in various parts of the country, but actually in most parts of the country, you'll probably be able to find the American bald eagle. So that's one of the uh, things we examined. Uh, we also examined uh, as well the uh, Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is something that, as I mentioned earlier, was a gift from the French to the Americans as a way of thanking them for ending slavery and to increase Franco-American friendship. But because it was put in a place where ships coming uh, into New York, New York Harbor with immigrants uh, or would see the, that that uh, welcoming uh, Lady Liberty. It became a symbol of immigration in our, in our country. In many ways, it was not what it was originally intended to be, but that's how it worked out. Uh, or st take Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain is the largest piece of granite 
that extrudes from the surface of the earth anywhere. It's in north of uh, Atlanta. And it was uh, a place that Ku Klux Klaners used to gather. And ultimately, uh, symbols of the, of the Confederacy were carved into the face of, of this. And the Vice President of the United States, Spiro T. Agnew, in 1972, went to dedicate this symbol to the Confederacy, which had the, the, the carvings of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson uh, and Jefferson Davis there. And so we try to examine whether it's a good thing to kind of promote still of these Confederate symbols or whether it's not a good thing. And that's one of the other things we, we examine in that, in that particular uh, series. What are your upcoming projects that you maybe would like to share? Are you working on a new book? Are you working on anything else? What can you share with us? Well, I'm currently working on a book on the American presidency. Uh, I have known a number of presidents. I've worked in the White House for one president, and I'm, I did a lot of interviews of presidential scholars. I've interviewed presidents themselves. And so that's a book that I would like to uh, get out sometime next year. And so that's one of my projects uh, that I'm working on right now. You are also, I believe, the chair of the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which is coming up very soon. I, it's August 12th. PBS Books is doing a series of 10 virtual conversations to promote the Library of Congress National Book Festival. Can you share with everyone a little bit about that and your involvement? Yes. The National Book Festival is a relatively new uh, part of the Library of Congress's undertakings. Uh, when uh, Laura Bush uh, came to Washington, Right before uh, her husband was inaugurated, uh, she had a reception. And at the reception, Jim Billington was there, the then library in a Congress. And she said to uh, Jim Billington, do you have a national book festival in Washington? She had chaired and created the Texas Book Festival. And he said, uh, quick thinking quickly on his feet, no, but we will. And so he quickly put together a national book festival. And now it's more than 20 years old, of course. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, I've been the co-chair of it with the Librarian of Congress. Typically, what we do is we have over one or two day period of time, several hundred thousand people come to meet with more than 150 or so authors who write, uh, uh, who, who have read from their books, who will sign autographs about their books and do other things relating to their books. And we have a lot of programs in the, at the National Book Festival for children. So it's uh, televised on uh, uh, various cable channels as well. But it's also a great time to, for free to come in and, and meet the famous authors you might have read about or want to know more about and also learn more about reading. And so uh, we're going to do it this year uh, in the middle of August because of that was the dates that, are, that worked out. Normally, it's typically near, near Labor Day. Yeah, it is from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. on August 12th. And what I will say is the first year I went was... I want to say it was 2019 and it was one of the most extraordinary experiences. You just, you get to see your favorite author and you get to meet your next favorite author. And it is all people who are curious, who want to learn, uh, which is a really good company. <laughs> so uh, thank you for also sharing about that. And also the beginning of that, because I don't think our audience necessarily knows the background of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. So that's really wonderful. Well, this has been extraordinary, David. Thank you so much for your time, for your work, for both for your book and for your series. They both, I think, really will be that wet the appetite of people to delve more. Oh, what are you reading? What are you reading that people should consider reading? Can you share maybe one or two books that you're reading? Yes, um, I've just finished reading and I am going to interview the author again. I interviewed her once, but I reread the book because it was so good. There's a book by uh, Beverly Gage, a professor at Yale on J. Edgar Hoover. It's a 900 page book, but it's a work of 15 years of research on our part. And I thought when I first read it, this deserves the Pulitzer Prize. And sure enough, this year, uh, the Pulitzer Prize in biography was given to this book, Beverly Gage. So I really highly recommend that book. On That's Jay such Edgar a Hoover. great it's such a great book. I, I've read the book as well, and I will be interviewing her um, as part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival PBS book series uh, later. I think it's early August. We'll do it right before the book festival. So yeah, she is ex an extraordinary woman. So that is certainly a great pick. And uh, it also has great photos in the middle of of just fun, fun things with J. Edgar Hoover. So that thank you for that. Sure. Thank you for your time. And um, any last words before we close the program, David? 
Uh, my last words are to everybody, you can't read enough and read books as well, because books have a way of focusing the brain in a way that a tweet doesn't quite do. So please read books, educate yourself, learn more about America, be an informed citizen and participate in making this country a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Well, just a reminder that Iconic America, Our Symbols and Our Stories resumes on Tuesday, July 11th at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Check your local listing. You can also catch up on the first four episodes at pbs.org. Search Iconic America. Well, for all of you out there, I always like to thank our library partners, more than 2,000 strong, as well as numerous PBS stations across the country. Most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Well, until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montia, and happy reading.